Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And we're recording this episode just before leaving for Australia. And as this airs, we should have just wrapped up SVP and taken off into the outback. (laughs) So hopefully that all went well and future Garrett and Sabrina are doing okay. And have not hit any kangaroos while driving. Yeah. And to celebrate, we're sending out a postcard to all of our patrons who joined by next week. So if you want a postcard with some pictures that we took at SVP and maybe along the road a little bit in Australia, then make sure you sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash I know Dino. This week in our 255th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a brand new allosauroid, some new trackways, and a tyrannosaur that's still being excavated. That's how new it is. How exciting. I think so. We also have an interview with Christopher Di Piazza, who's the creator of Prehistoric Beast of the Week and Dinosaur of the Day, Nyasasaurus. But before we get into all of that, we'd like to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Kyle, Brendan Kavanaugh, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, Rohan, Bradley, Bilal, Avery, Crispy, Jeb from Arkansas, Albertosaurus, Trev, Ayrton, and Everett, and Greg. And Trev, Ayrton, and Everett, and Greg all just joined, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate everything you do, and we couldn't have made it to Australia without your support. If you want to join this growing community of awesome dinosaur enthusiasts, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping into the news, we're going to start with our brand new dinosaur that's hot off the presses from Thailand. So the lead author actually on this paper is from Thailand, which I think is pretty cool. Their name is Duang Suda Chokcha Lomong. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too badly. And there's also one other co-author from Thailand. I don't think we've really seen many Thai paleontologists before, which is pretty exciting to me Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of good dinosaur work to be done there. Oh, yeah. And then there's also a couple of co-authors from Fukui in Japan because they get out and around Asia quite a bit <laughs> to other areas. The new dinosaur is named Siamraptor suwadai, and Siamraptor comes from Siam because that's another name for Thailand, plus raptor. And then suwadai is, quote, in honor of Mr. Suwat Liptop Anlop who supports and promotes the work of the Northeastern Research Institute of Petrified Wood and Mineral Resources, end quote. So apparently those mineral resources also include fossils, since both of the Thai authors on the paper are from that department as well. And it's also where the fossils are stored, so it's cool that they're staying in Thailand. And I also thought it was kind of funny because there was that recent court case in Montana saying that fossils aren't minerals. (laughs) But in Thailand, they still are minerals. Just adds to the confusion. It varies depending where in the world you are. Yeah. So these minerals or fossils were found in Korat, Thailand, and they're from the early Cretaceous, roughly, very roughly, 120 million years ago. In the abstract, they just call it the early Cretaceous or lower Cretaceous. But later on, they start to guess a little bit more precisely. (laughs) So I'm going with 120 million years. And previously, in the area, they found scattered iguanodontian fossils, but no other dinosaurs. And I don't even think those got named because they didn't name any dinosaurs, just like a few bones here and there. In the larger formation, they found other dinosaurs, but not in this specific spot. Annoyingly, Siam raptor is not a dromaeosaur or an oviraptor. So why is why does it have to end in raptor? It sounds cool, I guess, Siam mm-hmm. raptor, but it's an allosauroid. Clearly nothing like a raptor. And I really forgot all about the group Allosauroidea, and I assume I'm not the only one. So (laughs) as a quick refresher, Allosauroidea usually consists of Allosauridae, which is Allosaurus and all the really close relatives of Allosaurus, Metriacanthosauridae, and Siamraptor seems to be in Carcharodontosauria, which is kind of the third piece of Allosauroidea. So generally speaking, Allosauroidea is a branch of mostly apex predators that lasted for at least 80 million years from the late Jurassic to sometime in the late Cretaceous. Kind of depends on who you ask. It could have been like the very beginning of the late Cretaceous 
almost 100 million years ago, or maybe even pretty much right up till the end. Allosauroids all basically have narrow skulls. They have three fingered hands, which are usually good for grasping. We actually have an Allosaurus hand because I think they're some of the coolest things. Mm -hmm. It's a replica, not a real thing. <laughs> they thought we were teachers when we bought it. Yes. <laughs> and we bought it at Dinosaur National Monument, which we're going to talk about later. And they sometimes have small horns or crests on their head too, because an Allosaurus is often depicted with either horns or just those big bumps over its head. So that's basically what you should be thinking about with Siam Raptor. And the reason I'm just talking broadly about what Allosauroidea looks like is because Siam Raptor, at least this find, is not very complete. In fact, the holotype is only one partial bone. <laughs> it's basically just the back half of the right jaw. In other words, one quarter of the lower jaw. That's the entire thing that the name of this dinosaur is based on. Wow. But they did also find pieces from at least three other individuals, and that included pieces of the upper jaw, a few vertebrae, one hand claw, a piece of a tibia, a little bit of the hips, a single toe bone, and that means that it accounted for less than 10% of the animal, even when you combine four different animals. <laughs> so very incomplete and fragmentary find. But fortunately, there was enough material there to sort of piece together some details about it. For example, they did put in a real simple skeletal drawing with the bones that they found on it. And very roughly from that, because they drew it to scale, it was about eight meters or 26 feet long. Although I didn't see if they mentioned if it was still growing. So I guess potentially it could have been a little bit bigger. But 26 feet long for an allosauroid is, you know, about on scale with what you'd expect kind of being the adult size of it. So reasonably big especially for something that's 120 million years old. Like I said, the bones had some differences in both angle and there were also some depressions to make Siam Raptor different enough to get its own name. But the biggest difference is actually that the skeleton has a, quote, remarkable skeletal pneumatic system, end quote. In other words, there's a lot of space in the bones for air sacs or hollow bones or lightened bones or whatever your favorite terminology is for this. And they compare it to Murus Raptor, which was around about 30 million years after Siam Raptor. However, they point out that Murus Raptor could have been either a Carcharodontosaur or a Tyrannosaur. So it may not actually even be an Allosauroid, which means it's probably not related to Siam Raptor if that turns out to be the case, unless it just upends the whole Allosauroid thing completely, <laughs> which seems to happen all the time. It's always changing, always in need of more fossils too. Yes. But from what they can tell at the moment with their phylogenetic analysis, Siam Raptor is in Carcharodontosauria, which makes Siam Raptor, quote, the best preserved Carcharodontosaurian theropod in Southeast Asia, end quote, which tells you just how little we know about Carcharodontosaurus <laughs> from Southeast Asia, considering we have less than 10% of the animal. And the authors also say Siam Raptor has more basal traits than other Asian Carcharodontosaurs, including Fuqui Raptor, which is another allosauroid with Raptor in the name for some reason. <laughs> Everybody just likes the Raptor name way too much, and it's going to be everywhere, and I should just accept it. It has a nice ring to it. It does, but it's confusing. Lots of things in Dinosauria are confusing. That's true. There are people who are working to make it things less confusing, though like Rebecca Jensen, who reached out to us because Dan Schur mentioned her master's thesis in episode 103 when we interviewed him. And at the time, she was still working on it, but has since completed it. Yes, and sent it to us so we could check it out, which, thank you. It's a database and a map for Dinosaur National Monument. Yeah, it's really cool. So we talked before, I think, with Taya Budhu a little bit about how there was an interactive map that kind of showed you around the quarry so you could look at the wall and what's in Dinosaur National Monument right now mm -hmm. and kind of see which dinosaurs the bones belong to and stuff like that. That's the Carnegie Quarry. Yes. Well, the whole thing is kind of the Carnegie Quarry because the Carnegie Museum excavated a lot of the bones from the area before Dinosaur National Monument was created. So in this map, it's actually pretty cool they show four different types of excavators. They have the Carnegie Museum, which by the map you can tell got most of the bones from the area, which is, you know, it's the Carnegie Quarry. It makes sense. 
Then there's the Smithsonian, which managed to snag a little piece <laughs> off to the side. And the University of Utah, which also got a little piece kind of on the same right side of the quarry. If you're looking at the wall, it's actually to the right of where the wall ends if you were standing there today. And then, of course, there's the Dinosaur National Monument bones, which are still in situ in the wall. And it's really cool because with the maps that she put together for her thesis, you can see how much bigger the quarry originally was than what's still there. Oh, yeah. And if you've ever been there, you know that like the wall of bones is pretty big already. <laughs> but it looks like there were just a couple of sauropod bones maybe poking out of the top of the hill. And then they dug down and it was just like a treasure trove of tons and tons of dinosaurs. It's really cool. The thesis was to develop a database to link data with a digital map and make everything more easily accessible, which is really great. And we've seen efforts for this for other deposits or other formations. So it's good that there's more of them coming out. Yeah. There's 4,146 specimens that represent at least 105 individuals from 18 genera, and that includes 12 dinosaurs. There's also a crocodile morph and turtles and a freshwater clam and plant. <laughs> I was surprised there was a plant in the mix, too. That's kind of fun. Yeah, so I could see this making things a lot easier for paleontologists who want to study these different taxons and, and specimens because there's information about which parts have been found and their current repositories and some notes. Yeah, it's amazing that she managed to put this all back together from field notes from over 100 years ago, too, because the documentation back then <laughs> wasn't nearly as good as it is now. Yeah, so thanks again, Rebecca, for sharing this with us. It's really great. In a different part of Utah, although Dinosaur National Monument is Utah and Colorado, <laughs> but in St. George, Utah, carnivorous dinosaur footprints have been found. Ryan Singleton found the site near his home, and he contacted paleontologist Andrew Milner, who said that the footprints are about 200 million years old, and they belong to a carnivorous dinosaur that was about 50 to 60 pounds and 6 feet long. The tracks are in the middle of a dirt trail that's used by ATVs, so hopefully they can be excavated because there's concern that they'll be destroyed. That's a really interesting one. 200 million years old, six feet long, could be a really small dinosaur, potentially. Mm -hmm. Or it could be some other little monster. A monster, just an animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In Nevada, the Las Vegas Natural History Museum announced their paleontology team found 240 million year old vertebrate tracks. The University of Nevada Las Vegas student Alex Purcell found them back in 2018 and then they were recently confirmed. So at this point in time in Nevada, 240 million years ago, the area was on the edge of a sea in a shallow tidal flat environment and dinosaurs weren't that prominent. So the tracks are being studied in the Richard Ditton Learning Lab at the museum and then will be curated eventually by the National Park Service. Cool. Yeah, 240 million years ago is really right at the edge when dinosaurs were starting to be dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the other end, in Dickinson, North Dakota, the Dickinson's Badlands Dinosaur Museum has a new find of a 77 million year old tyrannosaur, which might help scientists better understand the evolution of T-Rex. So they're working on excavating it. They'll need to use a helicopter to bring back a five to six ton boulder that has the Oof. bones. Yeah. So they're fundraising now. They hope to get the block out by the end of next summer. That's going to need quite the helicopter. Mm -hmm. In Canada, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum has new fossils on display, including fossils from a juvenile triceratops, an adult triceratops, and a hadrosaur. And they've all been found in the east block of Grasslands National Park. In Geneva, Switzerland... The Pigway Auction House, not sure I pronounced that correctly, they recently sold Maximus, which is a 70 million year old dinosaur who is three meters long, and it sold for about 227,000 US dollars. So the person who sold Maximus sold some of his collection to continue funding his passion for paleontology, and this is according to the auction house. Smithsonian Mag published a list of spots to dig for dinosaur bones, if you're interested. So it includes the North Dakota Heritage Center in Bismarck, North Dakota, Paleo Adventures in Belfort, South Dakota, Wyoming Dinosaur Center in Thermopolis, Wyoming, and Two Medicine Dinosaur Center in Bynum, Montana, which is the one where we went to, so we can recommend. Yeah, it's always fun to go out on a dinosaur dig, and then you really appreciate just how hard it is mm -hmm. to go out there and find a dinosaur. Oh, yeah. And how much patience it takes. Yeah. Painstakingly chipping it out of rock mm -hmm. <laughs> or even dirt. 
In Sacramento, California, an Allosaurus, well, actually a person in an Allosaurus costume, stopped by a Sacramento City Hall meeting as part of a presentation about the Discover the Dinosaurs exhibit that's happening at the Sacramento Zoo. And that exhibit's open till January 5th. And this particular Allosaurus is named Al, and Al is scheduled to visit spots around Sacramento. Interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. And last, for fans of the comic and TV show Supergirl, the star of the show, Melissa Benno, shared a photo of her riding a dinosaur and hugging a T-Rex. And it looks like she's riding a Kentrosaurus because it's got the shoulder spikes. There might be a Baryonyx in the background, but I couldn't tell because I can only see a piece of it. There's no details of how the dinosaurs factor in, but I hope there's a lot of them. Is she going to fly back in time like Superman? Maybe. Overshoot? Could be. (laughs) Or there's some time traveling involved with some other characters from other shows. Oh, yeah. I'm just imagining her trying to go back like once around the Earth and accidentally spinning a billion times around the Earth. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be funny. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're recording this episode before leaving for Australia, but you still have time to join our Patreon and get a cool postcard from us. And you can also get updates from our trip along the way we're going to be posting mostly on patreon and discord for our patrons because they're the ones that help us get there and are probably the ones most interested in seeing what we're up to so if you want to get in on that make sure to join our patreon and then you can see the different dinosaur sites we're going to stop at all around the outback of australia we're also going to go to some museums in australia in the major cities, <laughs> not just in the middle of nowhere. And we'll be posting about meetups too that we still need to schedule, but should be scheduled by the time this comes out. So <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. And we really appreciate all of our patrons for helping us to fund some of this and share all of the information that we learn with all of you. So if you're interested in joining our Patreon, then head over to patreon.com slash I know dino and pick whichever reward speaks to you the most. And now on to our interview with Christopher Di Piazza. We're chatting today with Christopher Di Piazza, who is a science teacher, paleo artist, and creator of the popular site Prehistoric Beast of the Week, which covers a different prehistoric animal each week with an original painting by him, a photograph of the fossil, and whenever possible, input from a paleontologist who worked on that animal. Well, thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Like, what inspired you to start Prehistoric Beast of the Week? Well, you know, it's pretty typical. It's not particularly special or an uncommon story in that, like, you know, I was a little kid who was obsessed with dinosaurs. The difference is I, I just didn't grow out of it. And I refused to leave it uh, <laughs> when it came to, you know, my professional business and things like that. So I, uh, I went to college at, at Rutgers University and I got a degree in animal science and I, I, I tailored that degree to, to, to specifically work with um, reptiles and birds wherever I could. So I, I did a lot of undergraduate work with um, uh, specifically lizards, actually, but a variety of things. While I was there, I actually um, started working as a paleo artist, doing a little bit of artwork for the... Um, the geology museum that's actually at Rutgers. Oh, cool. It's a little teeny, teeny, tiny museum. It's very, very old. <laughs> um, We've been there. Very, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's beautiful. It's very old, very small. And um, one of the one of the murals in there is is by me. So that's, I guess, technically the first real paleo art I ever did as a, as a professional. Cool. Which mural was it? Um, it's the I don't when when were you guys there? maybe five years ago it's been a while okay so it would have been there it was in the glass case with the um the ammonites oh cool so it was an acrylic scene and it had like a mosasaur and an archelon and i think there's an elasmosaur up in no i not not think i, I did it there's definitely an elasmosaur <laughs> up there um Zyphactines, the fish is in there and a couple of ammonites are in the foreground it's not gigantic but it's pretty cool yeah that's um, awesome so that was the, I guess, as a professional, like when it comes to like getting paid, it was it wasn't a lot of money, but it was technically, you know, my first professional thing. And then, you know, if you go back in time again, at, at the same time, throughout middle school and high school, I was privileged enough to be 
sent to art school um, in addition to my public school that I was going to. Mm-hmm. So once a week after I was done with school, I would go over to the, the Ridgewood Art Institute in New Jersey. And um, I took a bunch of different classes. So I'm, I'm formally trained in oils, graphite, sculpting a little bit, but mostly predominantly watercolors. Mm. That's the one I, I took to the most. So overwhelmingly, my experiences with artwork is watercolors. I, I can work on other things, but that's what I prefer to work in. Is most of your work paleo? Yeah, almost all of it. I mean, back back then, um, when I was going to to the art school for it, I you know I was forced to do all kinds of things. Right, <laughs> so it was it was good. My my teacher Joel uh, Joel Papadix, he's brilliant. You, you could look him up; he's fantastic. He still teaches. You know, was pretty supportive. Um, so, but I would, I would do, you know, still lifes, humans every once in a while. I hated doing humans, but every once in a while I would be forced to do them regardless of how boring they might've seemed. Um, <laughs> landscapes, I didn't mind so much because that was at least nature, a lot of living animals, uh, which was a good, you know, a good move. And then again, parallel at the same time I was working at a zoo when I was a teenager. Hmm. So I was around pretty unusual animals from when I was as young as 13 years old in a setting that a lot of people my age were not. So by the time I was, and I continue to do that, maintain that relationship with that zoo to this day. Um, I was actually just texting the old, the owner of that zoo today, (laughs) but it was cool because I was in college and graduating college. And a lot of my peers were, you know, who wanted to work with exotic animals. Like, Oh, I just got an unpaid internship at a zoo. And I was like, well, I've been working at one getting paid since I was 13. (laughs) Um, It didn't really put me ahead of anybody because in the zoo field, it's very difficult to get full time, high paying work. That's not, you know, that was never the job description. Mm -hmm. But I continued to work at a a zoo for several years, even after college. So a lot of the, the paleo art is heavily based on experiences that I had with real animals, living animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I saw a picture of you with a caiman, right? Yeah, that that's Elvis. Uh, Elvis <laughs> is a he's a he's a Cuvier's dwarf caiman. My friend uh, had him dumped on her in a fish tank. So her her friend was moving, and he's like, "Oh, you like animals? Here, take this," and he gave it to her in a fish tank. And you can't keep that in a fish tank, much less in the state of New Jersey. That's super illegal. You can't do anything in New Jersey. Um, so she called me. And she's like, I have a Cayman. What do I do? So I, I called my uh, my boss, uh, my boss, John. And then we drove over. We picked him up. And it was really funny because whenever we deal with crocodilians, like we really don't want to get bit. So we were really cautious with him. And we taped his mouth shut really firm. And after a while, we realized that this Cayman was actually like really tame and um <laughs> very, very gentle. And I would be taping his mouth shut whenever we would use him for outreach programs. We like, you know, he bring bring him to schools to, you know, teach kids about animals. Mm -hmm. And I'd always tape his mouth shut, even though the kids weren't allowed to touch him anyway. You can't, you can't touch crocodilians in a lot of states Mm -hmm. without a permit. Uh. I would always tape his mouth shut, just to be sure. And he would never really struggle or, you know, or do anything. And the only time I ever actually got bit by him was when he like moved his head to the side while his mouth was still taped shut. And one of his teeth that sticks out to the side got me in the, between my thumb and my pointer finger. And I was like, this isn't worth it. Like the only reason why I got technically bit was because of the stupid tape. <laughs> so I stopped taping him shut and he's less stressed. We're less stressed. And he's just like a, you know, if, he's like a, a lot of people think he's not real because he just sits there and, and just chills. <laughs> when, when he's in his enclosure, he acts like a normal caiman. He swims, he hunts, you know, he thrashes around when he feels like it. But as soon as you pick him up, he goes limp. He's just the most relaxed crocodilian I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> We're very lucky to have him. Yeah, that's great. So when you got it, I assume since it was just in a fish tank, it must have been pretty young. He was pretty young, but also that fish tank was not big enough for him. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. The photo that you saw me with him, I on Facebook somewhere, I have a before and after picture of the two of us. <laughs> that I think are about seven years apart. So you can see how um, how much he's grown. When we first got him, he was maybe about, I would say two and a half, three feet long. And now he's close, he's about four feet long, maybe close to five feet long, which is about as big as they get typically. That's pretty big for an untaped mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so working 
with these animals, how did they influence your paleo art? Is it in their behaviors and then the way you depict movement? Were there other things? Yeah, no, definitely all of the above. So when it comes to like the um, the anatomy, and, and a lot of people know this, but it's 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 also very easy to overlook um, how obvious some of the clues about prehistoric animals are when it comes to, all you got to do is look at living animals. Like for instance, a lot of people don't realize birds of prey, like eagles and hawks, they're their digit two, the, the talon on their second digit is actually much longer than the other ones, very similar to a dromaeosaur. Hmm. Dromaeosaurs get all this attention for having that killer claw. Well, if you ever look at you know a close-up of an eagle's foot, look at their digit two. That talon is way longer than the other ones. Hmm. And they use it similarly to, I think, the latest idea where, where you know pinning food down while they rip it apart with their face. Mm-hmm. So there's things like that. I remember and it was also very easy to confirm stuff if I had quick access to these animals so for instance i remember there was a a debate going on of you know life appearances of non-avian dinosaurs where uh what kind of what 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 would their eyes have looked like um would they have had a white sclera like humans do or would it have been you know more were taken up by you know the the pupil like a lot of other animals would well elvis the caiman i know for a fact has a white sclera because i've seen it Mm because when i hold them and I rotate his face to the side, it shows a little bit. Normally, you wouldn't see that looking at a lot of photographs or, or books. But I was able to right away say, no, they have a white square. Like, it's not always visible, but it's there. There's a lot of debate. Still, people go off about this in paleo art, about um, the kinds of scales or the texture of the skin on uh, a lot of dinosaurs' feet. And um, especially with theropods and even non-theropod dinosaurs, where the on the foot, there would be a lot of artists depict those wide rectangular type scales that you would see typically on a bird. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know the ones I'm talking about. Kind of like a, I, I think of an ostrich foot. They're kind of like, it almost looks like the tread of a tire or something. Yeah, they have a name and, and they're technically not scales in the same biological sense as a, like a, a lizard scale. I think they're made of the same material as a feather they mm-hmm. found out, but functionally speaking, that's what they are. They're made of keratin. And a lot of people were saying for a while, oh, well, you know, since they, they're made of the same material as feathers, they evolved from feathered relatives. And therefore, it would be inaccurate to just pick those kinds of scales on a dinosaur that didn't evolve from a feathered relative, like a, like a ceratopsian or a hadrosaur or something. But all you have to do, look at a, look at an alligator's foot. They have the exact same type of scale texture on their feet. It's not from the same structure. I don't think it's a it's not from a shared common trait. They probably evolved it independently, but they have the same thing. So, you know, it was really cool to be able to look at these animals and get a really quick confirmation when it came to like a decision of whether or not something would be accurate. And that's like for visual stuff, uh, behavior stuff. Yeah. There's, there's some, some paintings I've done were directly based on uh, behavior of animals that I've, I've seen, I've worked with. The most obvious one that comes to mind is I did a, a painting of a Therizinosaurus hmm. several, like maybe four years ago. And the Therizinosaurus is, is sitting on his on his butt and he's using his claws to, to, to bend a sapling towards his mouth as he's eating. <laughs> but he's but he's asleep. So he's he's sit in this position and he, he fell asleep with the sapling bent towards him with some leaves hanging out of his mouth. He just like dropped you know was really tired that day and i got that pose and that situation from a sloth that i wouldn't <laughs> doing the same thing i worked with this two-toed sloth and we were feeding him and he was holding a, a, a leaf in his hand and he was munching and he took a bite took another bite and then he just fell asleep on the spot with the leaf in his hand. <laughs> and then i watched him wake up a couple hours later and he's like oh leaf nice and he just started eating it again <laughs> so that was that was based on that so i mean our sloths you know, a two-toed sloth, the same ecological niche as a therizinosaur? No. But they're both very weird. <laughs> they're both very weird. I'll give them that. They both have big claws. But it was just kind of a, yeah, but it was kind of a cool thing to say, like, why not? You know, who, who's to say it couldn't have happened? And it was just a fun thing that I wanted to depict somewhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. that is cool. Yeah, I'm looking at that image right now, and it looks very sloth-like. <laughs> yeah. I think I wrote a, a post about that on my website as well, and it shows a photo of the sloth. Mm-hmm. that I, I got the inspiration from. So 
prehistoric beast of the week. How long have you been doing this? Oh boy. Um, I think it was probably going full swing by 2012, I want to say, or mm. uh, it was, it, it had a different form at that point. It used to be, uh, I used to write for a website called Jersey boys on dinosaurs mm-hmm. and it was me and another person doing that. We kind of went our separate ways, but I wanted to keep doing it. So I basically took that website's like skeleton and I kind of fleshed it out to be 100% me. Mm-hmm. And that was prehistoric beast of the week. So I would say prehistoric beast of the week was, was itself going, uh, I think it was 2014, I want to say. And a lot of those early posts are, are from when it was Jersey Boys. They were just the ones that I wrote. Oh, nice. Yeah, you've covered a lot of animals. It does look like it's mostly dinosaurs, but there's a lot yeah, of other. <laughs> oh, and I'm I'm very unapologetic about that too. Like, I, <laughs> I, and people are like, you know, I I I do try to sprinkle in a variety when I can, but sometimes I have to write something quickly. I'm not able to do it every single week anymore, like I used to. It's usually prehistoric beasts of like the every two or three weeks, but that doesn't have a very good ring to it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but there's times where like crap. I like I have to pump a painting out in like several hours, and I I have to write an article. And dinosaurs are what I'm the most comfortable off the cuff doing this on. Mm-hmm. So usually I'll just resort to like, ah, oh, what's a dinosaur that I haven't done in a while, and I can pump one out of that. Whereas if I was doing a mammal or, or an invertebrate, while those animals don't deserve any less attention, I personally am not as um, fluent with them. Right. So that would require more research on my end to do an appropriate article. Yeah. Do you have any advice for other people who might be looking to get involved with museums? Like, How do you get in touch? How do you start working with them? Most opportunities that I've had, whether it be working at a museum or doing paleo art for a museum... I have had to be aggressive about getting <laughs> more often than not. I have, I have pursued someone or an organization to and convince them to take me. Well, I think, and I don't know, maybe this is just for me and other people have an easier time with it. <laughs> um, but the idea of, you know, Oh, well, if you're a good enough paleo artist, people will just come to you has not been the reality for me at all. Mm-hmm. Paleo art is a very saturated field. There are lots and lots and lots of really good artists who are all going for only a few opportunities. So I take it upon myself to to, to be aggressive. I'm not I'm not disrespectful or get in the way of anybody else, but I do try to advertise myself and appeal to places wherever I can. So for instance, like the job in 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 the the geology museum at Rutgers. I went out of my way to go say, hey, like, you know, I noticed you have like a blank space over there. Like, could you use some artwork there? I would like to do something for you Mm -hmm. here. Look at my portfolio. And it took them a while to to say yes. They had to figure out if they could afford to pay me or not. Um, In the the Academy of Natural Sciences, I uh, this past spring, I did a life size chalk drawing of Hadrosaurus Mm. uh, next to their skeleton, which is a kind of a neat thing. It's like a it's like a rotating a paleo art exhibit so they have a different artist do it every year oh, cool. so this um, you know bittersweet this spring they're going to erase it and a different artist is going to do it but you know they erase someone else's work for me to do it you know before that mm-hmm. so it's kind of kind of to show how you know our views on dinosaurs change as time goes on and also to show how multiple different artists can have different ideas on the same animal so it's kind of a neat concept yeah but my point is I worked there. They already knew I was there. They knew I was an artist, but no one came up to me and asked me to do that. I sent a letter and sent them samples the year I moved here, trying to convince them to let me to do it. And they said, no, they wanted (laughs) someone else to do it that year. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I didn't throw a tantrum about it. I, you know, and then as soon as it was time appropriate for me to try again, I tried again. Mm-hmm. And then I waited a very, very long time. And then when I least expected it, they got back to me and said they were going to use it. So, you know, my advice would be, you know, be aggressive and advocate for yourself. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of competition. And if you and it's not just about, you know, your skill or your talent as an artist. It's also who you know. It's about networking. Mm-hmm. So. There's a lot of artists who are getting a lot of work and they're very good at what they do. But there's also a lot of artists who are just as good who 
aren't really getting any work. And it's just simply because they don't have the connections. Mm -hmm. So the more friends you make and the more connections you make and the more networking you do, the better chance you will have to have opportunities. Yeah. Sounds also like you don't get discouraged and keep persisting too. Yeah. And that's the hardest part. It's very easy to get discouraged. And and my wife will be the first one to tell you that I'm sometimes a giant baby, (laughs) but you know, you compose yourself. You look at the big picture and uh, I try to look at it in in a positive light. You know, if if you know, it's not me, it's another really cool paleo artist that I could learn from that's doing a job. Yeah. It's a good way to look at it. Mm Mm-hmm. When you redo or when you do another version of an animal you've already done before, do you find, do you update things um, yeah. the way you depict it? Right, exactly. So, yeah, the Hadrosaurus is really cool because if you look and, and at the museum, have you, uh, you have you guys, you guys have been to the Academy, right? I'm we have, yeah. And we've seen that shock drawing. I didn't realize it was a different artist every year, though. Yeah. So I don't know who you saw when you were there. But uh, Ray Troll has has done one. He did one the year before, not the year before me, but the year before that. And Jason Poole did the very first one. Mm. Um, so you, if you look at like Jason, his was accurate for that time. Since then, a lot's come out about duckbill dinosaurs in general. Maybe not Hadrosaurus Falky itself, but duckbill dinosaurs in general. So when I did mine, I made a point to implement as many of those features as I could to kind of showcase everything that we've learned. So it's funny because the the chalkboard itself, because it's such a big scale, it would be easy for the artist to lose track of, of the proportions mm-hmm. and kind of make a wonky animal just the way it is. So they were nice enough to have a very basic outline, like a light gray outline that was permanent of the dinosaur. But what I actually had to do is I actually had to go over that outline and make it a lot bigger and beefier because mm-hmm. since then, Thanks to all these mummies, we know how that they had much thicker necks. They had much thicker tails, especially at the base. Hmm. So mine actually engulfs that that um, original outline. I also made the beak a lot longer because they're not really duckbill dinosaurs yeah. in the sense that they look like ducks anymore. They had beaks that look like shovels. So I had to extend i had to kind of add the basic outline of the skull which is i think based off of my asaurus skull and i had to um i just downturned and extended that beak all the way down and then i just did some more fun things that weren't necessarily inaccurate like i gave it a big dewlap like an iguana <laughs> and i did a bunch of little birds perched on it and flying around it kind of picking parasites off of it we know for a fact there were birds back then in some form. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to assume there was some kind of uh, symbiotic relationship between a bird and a very large dinosaur, just like there are with birds and large animals now. So those little birds were completely kind of made up, but they're not necessarily wrong either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you do something like, like you're going to do another Triceratops, do you yeah. end up changing a lot? Definitely. Yes. The last Triceratops I did was probably close to when the, the the website started. I think the year on that painting is 2014 or 2015, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And then since then, we found out a bit more about it, predominantly with regards to the, the, the face. So I think the latest idea is that Triceratops' entire face was just covered in keratin, hmm. like a turtle shell, whereas my original painting from it just had it more traditional just like skin so when that information first came out mark witten i think was the first one to do a really professionally done impression of the triceratops where he kind of had it all as one smooth or several large pieces of keratin with not as much texture like not really scaly texture on it um, which is totally valid but then you know everyone And their mother just did the exact same thing. (laughs) So you saw all these triceratops with this completely smooth head. And I'm thinking to myself, again, back to the living animals. Like, well, guys, like, you know, keratin can take a lot of different forms. And it doesn't have to be one smooth piece. It can still have, you know, like a rugose texture to it. Mm -hmm. It can still have the appearance of scales or scutes all over it. uh, And and still have been, you know, adhered to what the, the data is telling us. So mine is certainly different and updated from the original Triceratops. The horns are, are much longer and a little bit more curved toward the tips. 
And it's definitely communicated that that face is covered in keratin, but it's not so smooth and uniform like a lot of the other ones are, which aren't wrong. I'm not saying mine is better than theirs. I just want to do something that was a little different, but also valid. Yeah. So I was thinking more like the scutes on a turtle shell when I did mine. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting idea. Yeah. So for our listeners, if they wanted to find out more about you and see more of your work, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, definitely the website itself. So that would be... Uh, prehistoric beast of the week at blogspot.com i'm on social media as well on twitter it's just very simply at chris d piazza so there's no i between the d and the p mm -hmm. so chris d p i a z z a on twitter instagram i think it's just if you just put in my first and last name you'll i'll pop right up okay cool and and keep in mind it's not always going to be paleo art sometimes it's like pictures of my cat. <laughs> Sometimes it's cool. So I put a lot of pictures of the animals I work with too on there too. So it's a good mix of zoology and um, paleontology. Great. Nice. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Of course. And thank you for having me. It's been really cool. I'm really glad that you guys decided to keep me on here. Thanks so much, Chris, for chatting with us. We really enjoyed it. And we recorded this interview a few weeks ago. And so since then, Chris has actually posted the Triceratops that he talked about on Prehistoric Beast of the Week. And you should check it out. It's a really great post. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Nyasasaurus, which was a request from Goji via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Nyasasaurus was a dinosaur form that lived in the Middle Triassic in what is now Tanzania in the Manda Formation. And it may be the earliest known dinosaur. Yeah, that's the thing about dinosaur forms. Basically means it looks like a dinosaur. So it might be a dinosaur, but maybe not. Yes. And this one was described in 1956 by Alan Cherig in a doctoral thesis. But it wasn't officially described until 2013. The holotype was found in the 1930s by Francis Rex Parrington, along with cynodonts, dysonodonts, and rhynchosaurs. So Alan Cherig was one of Francis Parrington's PhD students, and he first described Nyasasaurus as specimen 50B. In 1967, Cherig used the name Nyasasaurus Parringtoni in a review of Archosauria, but didn't provide any description, so it was considered a nomum nudum, and also his dissertation was never published. <laughs> yeah. So in 2013, Sterling Nesbitt and Paul Barrett, Sarah Werning, and Christian Cedar published a new description and included... Alan Cherig posthumously to give Nyasasaurus Parringtoni a valid name. And Alan Cherig, he passed away in 1997. So the type species is Nyasasaurus Parringtoni, and the genus name means Lake Nyasa lizard. And that genus name refers to Lake Nyasa, and the species name is in honor of Parrington, you might have guessed. Before Nyasasaurus, the oldest known dinosaur was about 231 million years old, and it was found in Argentina, Herrerasaurus. Nyasasaurus is about 10 to 15 million years older than that. There are also a couple of other potential dinosaurs that might be the oldest, yes. which have been found too. It's all unclear at this point. Mm -hmm. So the type specimen of Nyasasaurus is a partial skeleton, six and a half to 9.8 feet or two to three meters long, and includes a right humerus, the upper arm bone, three partial sacral vertebrae, and three presacral vertebrae. A second specimen was found with more vertebrae, but it wasn't clear until Nesbitt and all described the specimen in 2013 that the two were definitely the same species. Nyasasaurus weighed between 45 to 135 pounds, 20 to 60 kilograms. No skull bones were found, so it's not clear what it ate. It's also not clear if it was bipedal or quadrupedal, but it probably had a long neck and tail. It's really hard to classify because of the fragmentary fossils that were found, but it is within Archosauria and within Dinosauriforms, which is the group that includes birds, non-avian dinosaurs, and some non-dinosaurian groups that lived in the Triassic. So it's thought to be one of the earliest dinosaurs, maybe even the earliest known one. Yeah, because whenever you have a large group like dinosaurs forming, there's all this other random evolution happening that goes into dead ends. So we can't say for sure that this was... Um, one of those dead ends or if it was actually a dinosaur that was on the right track towards later descendants. Nesbitt and his team did a systemic comparison of Nyasasaurus fossils with close relatives and found a number of characteristics that made it 
a true dinosaur, including three vertebrae in the sacrum, which connects the spine to the pelvis, compared to ancestors that only had two. It also grew rapidly, based on histology, and it had a broad bone crest on its upper arm, which attached to shoulder muscles. This crest was more than 30% of the bone's length, and it's known as an elongated deltopectoral crest. But the arm bone was fragmentary, so it's hard to know for sure if it really was more than 30% of the bone's length, and that made Nesbitt and his team not 100% sure that Nyasasaurus was a dinosaur. But at the very least, it would have been a very close relative. The arm bone had a lot of bone cells and blood vessels in the bone tissues, and that indicates rapid growth. And it showed Nyasasaurus grew as fast as other early dinosaurs, though not as fast as later dinosaurs. Nyasasaurus, being from Tanzania, helps support this idea of a southern Pangean origin for dinosaurs. When early dinosaurs like Eoraptor were in Argentina 10 million years after Nyasasaurus existed, there were already diverse groups of dinosaurs, and that meant dinosaurs must have been evolving for a while before that. It's been proposed that dinosaurs evolved and gradually became dominant instead of there being an explosion of dinosaurs as previously thought, but not all scientists agree with this, especially if it turns out that Nyasasaurus was just a close relative of dinosaurs instead of being a dinosaur. Yeah, but either way, it wasn't really until the Jurassic that dinosaurs really took over everything. So there's always going to be an explosion there relative to the Triassic. True. The oldest known Silosaurid, which is a close known relative of dinosaurs, a Coelosaurus kongwi was also in the mandibeds in Tanzania, and that shows that dinosaurs and their close relatives coexisted. The type specimen of Nyasasaurus is at the Natural History Museum in London, and the second referred specimen is in the South African Museum in Cape Town. Oh, British museums. Taking stuff from other countries. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if the first origin of dinosaurs was also from Africa, just like Homo sapiens. Yeah. And our fun fact of the day, even though that's not really a fact, but still a fun thought, (laughs) is inspired by Dan on the dinosaur mailing list who asked about how sauropods slept. And there were a lot of interesting answers, and then I went down my own rabbit hole. So the conclusion is that sauropods may not have slept much, if at all, at least not the way that we sleep. So according to a study... Wild African elephants, which are kind of our typical analogy for sauropods because they're big and they're herbivorous and they have four legs, all that stuff, they sleep less than any other mammal. In captivity, they sleep for about five hours, usually while lying down, but in the wild, African elephants only sleep about two hours and usually while standing. (laughs) Wow, safer that way? I think so. And on top of that, they often stay awake for several days at a time when they're traveling. And on the rare occasion that they do lie down to sleep, it's usually only for about an hour and they do it maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. So they really don't do a lot of sleeping the way that we think about sleeping, at least. For another comparison, you might think of whales since they're the largest animals that we have. And whales actually never sleep. Neither do dolphins, and this is mostly because they have to stay awake to breathe. They're what are known as conscious breathers, meaning that when they go unconscious, they don't breathe. So when we go unconscious and we're asleep, we just breathe, and there's air all around us, and it just can happen automatically. But since they're underwater, they have to swim up to the surface and then make the effort of breathing. They do it about once a half hour, depending on the species. And so if they sleep and they go unconscious, if they didn't wake up in that half hour interval, they would drown because they're not breathing. So what they do instead is they stay half awake. They actually only rest half of their brain at a time. And this is called unihemispheric slow wave sleep. So basically half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake. And I guess they do this for about eight hours a day which I suppose if it's half of their brain sleeping at a time, maybe it would be equivalent to about four hours of whole brain sleep, but I don't really know. And sometimes they slowly swim next to others in a pod or a companion while they sleep. (laughs) So it's not just like they're totally still just breathing a little bit. They're actually moving around a little bit while they're half asleep. I wonder if that means they don't dream. I'm not sure. I know that elephants occasionally get into REM sleep, so... But they do, you know, more of a deep sleep just for brief periods of time. Yeah, I'm not sure if whales do. Seems like that could be risky, be kind of like sleepwalking. (laughs) And then 
One thing that wasn't talked about on the mailing list that I needed to dive into was the closest living relatives, also known as crocodilians and birds. So crocodiles and some birds also use the whale dolphin strategy of sleeping half their brain at a time. And some of them literally sleep with one eye open, (laughs) which is just fun because of the expression. So a study of crocodiles saw that their eye tracks humans and other potential threats while the other half of their brain is asleep. So they have like the eye on one side of their head looking around while the other eye and half of the brain is asleep. (laughs) It's pretty crazy. And then there's another study of an alpine swift bird that has been recorded flying for 200 days nonstop back and forth between Europe and Africa. That's crazy. Yeah. And because of that, it's probable that the swift is actually half sleeping while it's flying. (laughs) (laughs) So when you put together the fact that some birds and some crocodilians can both half sleep in a similar way, it's possible that there's a common archosaur ancestor that's capable of this half sleep that all of its descendants just kind of inherited. And if that's the case, then that would include all of the non-avian dinosaurs. And maybe all of them were sort of half asleep, you know, on edge (laughs) all the time. It really makes the Mesozoic seem like a terrifying place, although it already did sound like a terrifying place. So maybe it makes sense that they would have to all be half awake all the time looking out for threats. I prefer our way of sleeping. Yeah, me too. (laughs) It's one of the advantages of having a home that you can surround yourself in walls with. Mm -hmm. More peaceful. Yes. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And you have one more week to join our Patreon and get some cool rewards. That's at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. Until next time. Good day.